So let, let me pray for us, and then we're going we're gonna to get started, all right? Father, thank you for uh, giving us Zoom uh, and computers and phones and, and ways to uh, connect with each other. I thank you for the opportunity, Father, to open up your word and to study it. Um, we pray, Lord, that you would do all the things we've been discussing, uh, that you would give us such such a, a desire for your word that we, 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 we can hardly be quenched by it, that we have to keep coming to it because we're so thirsty for you, knowing that we can find you in your word. Lord, Lord I pray that you would reveal yourself to us and, and, and show us the relationship between our effort to seek you in your word and your in your luscious willingness to reveal yourself and bestow upon us the knowledge of the truth uh, that that we might be useful useful to you and, and a pleasure to you um, not not just people that are, are are walking around in life and, and more or less sure of their salvation and, and trying to do a good thing here or there, uh, but really pursuing you with all vigor and, and, and knowing that you're going to show us who you are uh, so that you really are the single most important thing in our lives. That's our prayer, Father. We trust the time to you. Uh, please come and teach us, Lord, through your word in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So this will be our first uh, first study in Hebrews. It, I, I had the opportunity uh, over the last several months to go in, you know, if y'all can imagine this, to go into a, a Bible study at, at O Dark 30 at our church and teach a chapter of Hebrews in 15 minutes. I could hardly read a verse in 15 minutes. So we have all the time in the world. We don't have to, oh, and I wasn't teaching every verse in order. I was teaching the odd verses, which I think are some of the better ones. I was teaching one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15 minutes each. And I think the last two, uh, Dan, I didn't even finish the last two, did I? Because of COVID hit. So now we've got plenty of time. We're not in any hurry. We're, 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 I'm, not, I'm not carving out sermons um, with starts and stops. We are just going to, to plow into his word and uh, and let it do its thing in our lives, okay? So here we go. All right. So I want to talk about, first of all, uh, the author of the book. The author of the book of Hebrews is unknown to us. Um, the, uh, you know, lots of people have their theories. I certainly have my theory. I don't mind sharing it with you. This is a Bible study, not a sermon. Um, I think Paul's the author. Um, I've, I've heard some arguments, you know, that are somewhat credible that other people might be um, the writer. But um, I, I think if we had a half an hour, I could convince you that Paul was the author for some, on, on the basis of some argumentation, I'm pretty sure you've never, never even heard. Uh, not the least of which, how many letters he wrote and, and, um, and wh whether or not uh, his, his own canon is short without it. But anyway, I, I, I don't want to get off on that. I think that's more of a <clears throat> tangential issue. Uh, instead, I, I think there's a more important question than who wrote it. In fact, I think the fact that, it, that we don't know who wrote it is going to drive a big part of our study tonight. And uh, I need somebody to be on the clock. I need somebody to tell me when it's 20 before the hour, okay? Can we do that? Somebody, yeah. I need a hand. Raise a hand, somebody. All right, Tara, 20 before the hour. 
Okay. So the better question is, if, if we don't know who wrote the book, uh, why should we, you know, why should we accept it? Why, why should we think that it's, you know, useful? Uh, why, why should we think it's God's word? Why should it, you know, why should it be in the canon of scripture? I mean, why, you know, and, and then, and then that, uh, you know, begs the further question, uh, how did Hebrews get into the canon of scripture anyway, or the gospels or Paul's letters or the revelation or Genesis for that matter, uh, or the prophets? I mean, how did any of those books get into the canon of scripture? Um, you know, was there some process? Was it Constantine? Some people think that the emperor Constantine, because he became a maybe, became a born again Christian, maybe, um, and and made Christianity the uh, the religion of of the realm after four centuries of literal torture. Uh, I don't like the word persecution when you want to make the point because persecution sounds too too thin. Torture is what was going on. That's what persecution was all about in the early church. It wasn't that people said, eh, you're a Christian, you know, I don't like you. That's what we think persecution is today. Somebody hurts our feelings. Uh, these people were burned at the stake and wouldn't recant. So anyway, Constantine didn't have anything to do with the canon of Scripture. When we say canon, we just mean those are the books of the Bible. Which ones are in the Bible? The total sum of the books is called the canon. One N, C-A-N-O-N. So how did we get the Bible that we've got today? How did these books get in there? I want to spend a few minutes on that. Uh, there was no formal process. I remember sitting in seminary under Dr. Ben Phillips. Some of you listening know who I'm talking about. Uh, I was sitting under him, and he said there was no formal process for uh, assembling the text of the Bible or, or the, the, the canon of the Bible. And that just, I'm an organized person. Everything in my life has a tackle box. My own car is Noel's tackle box. I'm the tackle that's in the tackle box. Uh, it's arranged perfectly. Uh, all, all my shirts in my closet are half an inch apart. Um, the back half of the closet where Stephanie lives is chaos. Um, I couldn't conceive of the Bible not having a process. What you talking about, man? And like a fool, one of the few times I raised my hand and challenged my professor in seminary, I raised my hand and said, excuse me, how could that possibly be? And then when he gave the class the answer, it was oops upside the head. Since then, I've read and taught and written on the subject quite a bit. Um, Got a longer article on uh, on apology of Berthas or if anybody ever wants to go look into it a little bit more, but we're gonna touch on some of that now. The books of the Bible emerged as those divinely inspired by God because they were accepted by the church. This means that no one sat down and said, well, let's, let's have a meeting and let's, let's go through them all and let's pick some and I like this one or I don't like that one. No, 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 no. You gotta keep in mind, in the ancient world, there was, there was no phones, there was no internet, there was no uh, uh, any kind of television or electronic communication of any kind. So you had all these people all over the gospel world, all around the Mediterranean, North Africa, Western Asia, which we call the Middle East, uh, Europe. You had all these people that were Christians, and many of them never traveled more than a few miles from their homes. 
all believe in the same things about God, all believe in the same things about the gospel, and all getting their information from the same writings. I mean, there were, there were thousands of copies of these letters that were circulating through the church, and there were other letters that were, that were not considered inspired, and by and large, whenever the church would come together, it wasn't, it wasn't that someone sat down and came up with a list. It's that as they commiserated and as they discussed other church business, the guys from Africa came up and the, and the, and the guys from Rome and Europe were there. And, and, uh, uh, you know, the guys from uh, the Jerusalem church and all these churches in Asia and Asia Minor and Turkey today. Uh, they would get together, and they all knew that James, that James was inspired. They all knew uh, that Romans was inspired. They all knew that Revelation was inspired because all of those books met a certain number of tests. And I want to walk through some of those, those tests with you. So the first thing to know is that the canon of Scripture that we have today was not developed, it emerged. Like right now, if you can drive past my house right this very instant, I didn't see it yesterday, I saw it today, I got mushrooms this big in a giant circle in my front yard. This big, big old honking mushrooms. They just emerged. I didn't plant them. Nobody, nobody grew them, fertilized them. They just emerged. So the Bible, the canon of scripture emerged organically within the church because the church recognized the books that were inspired. Now, what is, what is the word inspiration? I mean, what, what, what is inspirational? Inspiration is a doctrine. It's the doctrine of our view of how the text of scripture was written. So how, you know, how did God write uh, uh, Genesis? How did, well, we'll stick with Genesis for a minute. Uh, there's something called the Neo-Orthodox view. The, the Neo-Orthodox view is the view that, um, God, that the Bible contains the Word of God, but it isn't itself the Word of God, which means that it has errors, omissions, that um, its uh, scientific claims aren't always correct. Uh, it's geographical, it's historical claims, it's theological claims are not always going to be correct. Um, that it should be regarded as a book of human origin, that it was, it was written by humans, and when you read it or I read it, we can each come away with our own understanding, our own meaning. We, that, that's where we're putting meaning into the text instead of the text putting meaning into us. So that's, that's neo-orthodoxy. Then you've got the liberal view of inspiration, also sometimes known as the uh, modernist view. And this is the view that says, well, there were, there were good people that wrote the texts. Uh, they're not really uh, God's word, but they're, they're ancient literature, and they have errors. But there are kernels of truth, and you have to go find them. Now, that puts you in a very subjective position of determining what is truth and what is not truth. What is written by man and what parts are actually God's you know, kernels of truth. That's the liberal view. Then you have something called natural inspiration. Uh, incidentally, I am going to provide my teaching notes uh, for every study that we do. So, you know, take all the notes you want, but uh, my notes will be there. So um, you don't have to. I, I would go into seminary class back in the day, and I would quietly and humbly with the, 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 the most needy and uh, defeated look on my face I could come up with and try to look smaller than I am and say to my professors, man, I can listen or take notes, but I can't listen and take notes. So I'll ace your class if you give me your notes every single time they did. So um, I've even applied that here at World Hope Bible Institute where we had an instructor guide 
with maybe 50 pages, and then we had a student guide with maybe 20 pages, and the question is, why are we doing that? Why don't the students get the whole thing and let the students just listen and absorb and then take their notes later or comment or jot on their notes? So anyway, so we're right now in the middle, if you can believe this, Dustin, our entire curriculum is being reformatted so that the student guide and the instructor guide is the same with a couple of appendix items for the instructors that the students don't need. So, so all that's going to be available. Um, natural inspiration. Men, I'm going to read this one to you. Men of remarkable religious insight express their understanding of God, mix it with their own experiences and views, and produce texts which, again, contain some historical, scientific, and theological errors. Uh, then you got verbal dictation. That's the stenographer view. God spoke. People wrote it down. Uh, that one's got that one. That one's probably got more people within Christianity today that believe that's the method that we should accept, and it's the easiest one to refute. Um, read the first couple of verses of Luke. O Theophilus. And he explains how he went high and low and far and wide, gathering information and interviewing people and collecting all the facts and putting them in order. Well, if God was dictating, he would not have had to have gone through any, any work to determine what exactly occurred in the life of Jesus Christ and what the had to have done there. So that's verbal dictation. Um, you, you get close to... Uh, where we want to be with verbal dictation, because if God verbally dictated his word, then it's completely authoritative. Amen. It's completely accurate, and it's completely sufficient for our salvation. But the best view of inspiration is called verbal plenary inspiration. Verbal plenary inspiration. That's a fancy term. It just means verbal, the words plenary all the words it means all the words are inspired by god but they were written through human beings through human personalities through human perspectives now i don't mean human perspectives as you know peter has one view of theology and paul has another no 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 i mean different perspectives uh, for example when you lived and what you saw and what you experienced in your interactions with god uh, the Gospels are a good example of this. We have four Gospels. Why? Because we have four aspects of Christ that are being explained to us. Uh, Matthew, for example, wrote to the Jews specifically to demonstrate that Jesus was the king of the Jews. His genealogy um, starts with the very first Jew, which is Abraham, and runs down the royal line. At Solomon runs down the royal line uh, down to uh, Jesus' earthly father, which is Joseph. Uh, Mark, for example, is presenting Jesus as a beast of burden, as a suffering servant. There is no genealogy. Who cares about a genealogy of, uh, of a servant or of a slave? Nobody. Um, he wrote to the Romans. And on and on, I could go through those. The point, the, the point being, um, verbal... Verbal plenary inspiration means that all of the words were inspired by God, but they were inspired through human personalities, through human experiences. Um, they used their own illustrations from their own lifetimes and from their own eras. They used examples in their own histories. But what they said was inspired by God, and thus it is without error. It's perfect. It's fully sufficient for our salvation. And um, any other view of inspiration is going to be a lesser view and not supported by the text of Scripture itself. So let me run through the criteria that the church was using and today still uses to determine whether or not a book is inspired and not to be included in the canon. 
Let me just hit these real fast. Uh, the first one, of course, is does the church acknowledge it? <clears throat> does the church accept the book as inspired? Uh, number two is was the book written by a prophet of God? If it was written by a person who spoke for God, then it's God's word, right? If it was not written by a person who spoke for God, then it was not God's word. Um, can somebody look up Deuteronomy 18 real quick? And then uh, who's going to do that? Raise your hand. Deuteronomy, all right, Chelsea. Uh, look up Deuteronomy 18, and, and uh, we'll, we'll need a couple of verses from you. You'll need to unmute yourself. Um, if, the, if, the, if you're referring to one of the Gospels, the question became, uh, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, was it written by an eyewitness, or was it based on eyewitness accounts? If it wasn't, it couldn't be considered a Gospel. There are, there's a Gospel of Timothy out there. Uh, there's other so-called gospels that are supposed to be stories, um, chronologies um, of the life, work, ministry, person of Jesus, and they are not gospels. They, they fail the test of eyewitness or based on eyewitness account. Chelsea, could you get, give us uh, verses 21 and 22? Now, she's going to be reading on the question of uh, if a book was written by a prophet of God, then it's God's word. But what if it was not a person uh, who spoke for God? How, how could we know that? Whether or not, how could we discern a prophet from a non-prophet? Go ahead, Chelsea. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. All right. So prophets routinely gave prophecies that were not only uh, foretelling, uh, you know, giving uh, uh, giving information that God wanted given, making statements to to Israel or to others that God wanted made, but also predicting future events, foretelling. And prophets foretold, and if prophets foretold and they were wrong, they were false prophets. So there, and if you think about it, there's a genius in those two verses, uh, not unlike the genius in every verse of scripture. But if you read it, it says the word which was not spoken by the prophet. It's not how do you tell which ones are uh, are not spoken by God. Rather. It's, it's, it's not that you can discern the things that prophets have given that are true. You can determine which ones are false because the false ones don't come true. A false prophet can, can, can make a prophecy in, in about something that's going to happen 10,000 years from now. Well, that's neither here nor there for us. That's not a tool. But if he gives a prophet and it doesn't come true, He's off the list. He's no longer a prophet. So was the book um, written by a prophet of God? If so, then it's God's word. If not, then it's not God's word. Um, prophets routinely gave prophecies about future events, and when they failed, they became false prophets. They were not, and none of their, their writings were considered canonical scripture or inspired by God. Um, if a gospel, eyewitness account, or based on an eyewitness account, Number three, or number four, uh, was the book truthful about God? You might say, well, that's kind of a, you know, that kind of goes without saying. But the question is, is could anything in the text be impeached? Uh, like, like a witness at a trial, if you, if, if, if you have a, a star witness, the other, the other team, let's say the prosecution has a star witness, well, the defense wants to impeach the witness by demonstrating that what the witness is saying is not true or, or anything that the witness is saying is not true. Because if the witness is lying about one thing, then the witness is probably lying about everything. Everybody knows that argument, right? Well, it's the same for a, a so-called writer of scripture. If there's anything in there that can be refuted, I, I remember back in the old late 1990s after I'd become a bit of a believer for a while, uh, there was this big movement in the church. Hank Hanegraaff, Bob Lanserman, uh, wrote two books on the subject. One of them was called Christianity in Crisis, and uh, uh, 
forget what the other one was, but uh, there was there was this movement. Um, there was a movement in the church that was not. It was it was a gross exploitation of the already false doctrines of um, the words escaping me. Uh, prosperity. Sorry. Thank you. And. Uh, these guys would come on and they would they would claim to have healing ministries. Benny Hinn was one of the guys. He would wave his coat at people and 500 people in an auditorium would fall out of their seats. Uh, all this kind of silliness. People running around making animal manifestations, barking like dogs. Uh, there was so much crazy stuff going on in the church. And there were all these so-called prophets rising up. And these prophets would, would give all kinds of prophecies, and all kinds of their prophecies would, would be proven false. And I remember more than one of them at the time getting caught in this, you know, exuberance that I'm a prophet, and I'm going to tell you all these things that are going to happen, and, you know, God's going to do this or that or the other, and then none of those things came true, or, or a lot of them did not come true. They would say that a prophet can't be expected to be 100% accurate. Excuse me? Deuteronomy 18 says otherwise. If a prophet is wrong one time, a prophet is a false prophet. You, can you imagine Isaiah going around giving prophecies and some of them just aren't true? Or Moses going around giving prophecies and some of them aren't really true? God's not going to allow a true prophet to give false prophecies. He's not going to do that. Otherwise, there's no way to discern what's true and what's not true and who's a prophet and who's not a prophet. So the last one, is, or oh, excuse me, two more. Uh, is the book truthful? If it's not, then you can impeach it. It's out. If you can find anything about it that's not true, the book is out. Uh, was the book attended by miracles? Now, this is important to, to get this down. Miracles validated a message. Miracles validated a message. Uh, could somebody uh, look up? Uh, oh gosh, I'll just leave it for you in the notes. But uh, miracles validated a message. There was a time when Jesus was uh, presented with a, a paralytic man. This is, I think, is in Mark 2, Mark 2 or Matthew 11, one of the two. I'll give it to you in the notes. And uh, Jesus said to the man, your, your, your sins are forgiven. Now, the man was there for healing. But Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Some of the people there were murmuring and they were thinking in their hearts, I mean, who does this guy think he is? Forgiven sins. Guy can't forgive sins. And Jesus understood what they were thinking. And he said, that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Hey, he, he looks at the guy and basically, I'm paraphrasing, rise and walk. And the guy rises and walks. So if, if, you can, if you can make a truth claim and then perform a supernatural act, that lends credence to your claim. So Every single thing that Jesus said is validated by his miracle um, ministry. There was a time when, when John the Baptist, uh, in fact, I want to make sure y'all get this. If, 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 if you've heard that John the Baptist ever lost his faith or doubted who Jesus was, that, that preacher or teacher is mistaken. Uh, it was some of the followers of John the Baptist that were getting concerned. Their boss had gotten himself arrested and put into prison. Uh, they were left on their own, flailing around out there, fish out of water. And they started to question whether or not Jesus was the Christ. And they go to John and they say, is it really him? And John says, go to him and and see what he has to say and jesus says uh the prophet said i'm paraphrasing or I'm, I'm i'm not even paraphrasing whatever the other word is i'm summarizing jesus said that i raised the dead i caused the lame to walk 
Um, I healed the blind. Uh, I healed the deaf. And I raised people from the dead. Now, what did the prophets say the Messiah was going to do? Well, that was the list. Right? Yeah, so, 840. Pardon me? 841. 840. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Jesus' message was validated by his miracle ministry. Moses' message. You remember when Moses went to Pharaoh uh, and said, you know, God said, let my people go. And he's like, no, why do I have to listen to you? Who's your God? I never even heard of your God. I don't believe your God. And he brought 10 plagues. Right? Frogs and, uh, you know, water turn into blood and all the way up until the death of the firstborn of every, of every house. So when you're looking at a, at the canon of scripture and you're trying to determine, well, does this book belong or, belong or does it not? Well, was its writer attended by miracles? Was the book attended by miracles? If so, uh, then it's in the canon. It's, it's inspired. And then the last one, was it attended by the power of God? Now, here's another one you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, well if, a if a book did not carry the life-changing power of God, Hebrews, Hebrews uh, 4, 12 said, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing or separating of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word is actually a real living, breathing thing. It's him. He is living. His word is living because they can't be separated. So his word has the power that he has. He says once in the Old Testament that uh, he sends his word forth and it will accomplish all the things that he intends it to accomplish. It will not return to him void. It won't come back going, hey, boss, we didn't get the job done. His word will accomplish anything that he wants because his word is him and he's God. So the question is, is, does the book of Hebrews make the cut when we start looking at all this criteria? And of course it does. Uh, it was universally accepted by the church uh, as inspired. It was obviously written by a prophet of God as we go through this book. The, the, the depth of instruction and understanding of God's ways and the gospel, the gospel as it was seen and presented in the Old Testament, as it's seen and presented in the New Testament, is clearly a prophet of God. Uh, and then uh, uh, it's truthful about God in excruciating detail. I mean, in the extreme, as we go through uh, one verse after the next after the next, going through the Old Testament sacrificial system, the understanding of what angels are, uh, the, un the understanding of the priesthood, uh, all of it is accurate. There's no Hebrew uh, scholar that could sit down and go through the New Testament book of Hebrews and go, aha, error, aha. That's wrong. Aha! Uh -huh. They got that wrong. Nope. Writer is accurate in every single claim that is made. So the book of Hebrews makes the cut. It is included in the can of scripture, and that's more important than us actually knowing uh, who wrote the book. Uh, a few other points, and then we'll, we'll open up for questions. Uh, Hebrews had three authors, or excuse me, three members of its audience, or three target groups. Uh, first was un, was um, unregenerate Jews. This book was written in part to convince Jews that Jesus was their Messiah. And in fact, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read a verse for you real quick, uh, a couple of verses. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says this. So follow what I'm saying. The book of Hebrews was written to unregenerate Jews to show them that Jesus was their Messiah, one, and two, to remove their salvation. What? That's right. Listen to the passage. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 26. Now, this is Hebrews 10. This is after he's done all this explanation, demonstrating that Jesus is superior to Moses, superior to the angels, <clears throat> superior to the prophets, superior to the priesthood, superior to the temple, superior to everything. He's showing that Jesus is superior to all this and demonstrating that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus bar Joseph, son of Joseph, the carpenter's son, is in fact the Messiah. Now, once that's been done, he makes this statement. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, 
That means if we go on rejecting Jesus as the Messiah after I've just spent nine and a half chapters explaining this to you, you now have the knowledge of the truth if you've read this book. If you go on sinning, willfully rejecting Jesus as your Messiah, here's your consequence, Hebrews 10, 26. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. What? Yeah, you were covered under the system until the Messiah showed up. He showed up. You rejected him. You're out. You have to come back in through faith. Keeping the law is no longer going to work for you. You now have to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah, or you are out of the kingdom. You have, you, you have literally this one time in all of history, you've lost your salvation. Do you see that transition from the old system to the new? If you're stuck in the old system, you can't say, well, yeah, I hear you on that Jesus stuff, but I'm not accepting that. I'm, I'm going I'm to stick with him and showed up yet. I'm going to reject him as my Messiah. Buddy, you needed to read Hebrews 10 because your salvation is gone. Here's what it says instead. For if we go on sinning willfully after having received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Instead, verse 27 but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries, meaning of God. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you suppose he will deserve who has trampled under for the Son of God, regarded as unclean the blood of covenant, by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? It's the Spirit of Grace and the Holy Spirit that convicts us that Jesus is the Messiah, right? So to reject him is to trample him underfoot, and is to grieve the Holy Spirit, is to reject uh, his witness, and to say that the blood of Christ that was shed is not sufficient to cover our sins. That's what you're doing by rejecting Jesus as your Messiah. So we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Woo! So this book was written to three groups. One, it was written to unregenerate Jews to either accept Jesus as their Messiah or remove their covering. Yom Kippur didn't do it anymore. Second group, regenerate Jews, Messianic Jews we say today, Jews who, who are Jewish by tradition, Jewish by faith, Jewish by history. But they come to understand, recognize, and accept that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus bar Joseph, is in fact the Messiah who was promised, starting with Moses. And then the third group are unregenerate Gentiles. That's anybody who needs to hear the gospel and may have no knowledge of the Old Testament or the sacrificial system. Because the way the book of Hebrews is presented, it is presented to give the understanding to even the novice, to even the person who has no religious understanding whatsoever. That person can sit down and with a proper instructor can walk through that book and be convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and the person must place his or her faith in that Messiah in order to be redeemed and given salvation and forgiveness and eternal life. So we're going we're gonna to stop there. Um, I'm going to mark that spot in my notes, and we will pick up. I'm sorry, we didn't get to verse 1 just yet, but we need to lay this foundation and get us, um, we need to get, get us to where, as we're approaching this book and we're walking through this book, we have a very good, solid foundation upon which we stand. So we will stop. Let me, uh, let me just edit my notes right there. Does anyone have a question? On the text, on this, on on this, on the well, not on the text, but on Hebrews. Say, we didn't get into the text. Inspiration, authorship, uh, uh, in any of the items that we covered. Yes, yes. All right, go ahead. Let me turn up my speaker here a little bit. Go ahead. This idea about um, John that you said is 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 new to me, and I'm just trying to figure out where you got that or how you got there. All right, well, first of all, I was very, very nervous when I made those the discovery and claims when I first did. 
Um, and then I found uh, later on, I mean years later, that I was in good company with people like John MacArthur and others who, who took more time with the text. Um, there's, a, there's a time when Jesus' uh, disciples are, or excuse me, where John's disciples are, um, uh, they're, in, they're in doubt. In fact, um, I'll find the uh, passage for you. Give me one second. Uh, can we start with Matthew 11, too? Um, yeah, hold on one second. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, yes, we can go there. I had that. That's in the notes. That passage, actually. So you'll get that. Uh, Matthew eleven. Yeah, let's just walk through here. Matthew. Yeah, I think it's two through fifteen. Why don't you read that for us, Dustin? Um. Now, when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples uh, and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you heard and see. Um, the blind receive sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Right. Did you want me to keep going? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, up through fifteen, but uh, but uh, that's yeah. I mean, that's the that's the crux of the of the issue. Um, let me give you the other passage we want to see. Got to look this up for you. Give me a second. Uh, give me, just hang tight. I'll get there. Man, I can't find the verse reference in my notes, so I'll have to find it another way. Just hang tight. Um, Might be Luke 7. I'm looking real quick. Um, it's hard to get my finger on this passage. Um, I should have been prepared, though, if I was going to make that remark. Um, I'm sorry. I, just, I was like, that's new. I need to, you know, I need to, whatever yeah. that is, I need to learn that. Show me the math. Yeah, it's it's not it's not that I don't know it. That's, I just can't put my finger oh, on the verse. But but let me just I know. I'll, I'll I'll get it for you and I'll send okay. out I'll send it out to everybody because I don't want to just have y'all looking in my ear while I'm looking for it. No, I'm not I'm not challenging you. That's just never been presented. No, no, no I know, I know. But there's, there's I, a, I wanna I wanna look at that. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a passage in the gospels where the disciples of John the Baptist are questioning whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. It's not connected directly to this passage. It's, it's a little before. So then when we come to this later and you see it in its context, you think, well, that looks like John's the one who's, who's questioning Jesus now that he's in jail. But it isn't John who's questioning. It's his disciples. And so when his disciples come to him with this uh, uncertainty, he says, hey, go ask him. If he's the Messiah, and then and get it straight from him. Don't listen to me. You go get it straight from him. So if you read that, what you just read from the perspective that they were the ones that were questioning, it still fits exactly everything that occurred there fits because he's saying, "Look, don't trust me. I'm just some lowly dude. I can't even untie his sandal." 
You go see him in person and you ask him yourself and you get your answer. And same, then you come back. Order of events, but that whatever that additional perspective is, is widens that scope. Yeah, um, let's see here. I might, uh, this might happen. But don't worry about it. We can send it later. I just, I, that right there is enough to chew on. I, uh, anyways, yeah, I just want to consider it. So whenever. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you the verse, though. I'll get you the okay. passage. Just a couple All of right. verses where he doubts. But that's a good question. I should have been ready for that one. Sorry, I haven't taught the Bible in a while. I'll try, I'll try not to be so rusty. Uh, another question on our discussion tonight. Yeah, because that's that's what all of us would accuse you of is being yeah. rusty. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little rusty right now. Okay, so uh, any other questions related to what we covered uh, tonight? All right. So, um, the verse you were looking for was Luke seven uh, fifteen. I mentioned seven, but it didn't look right. Let me get there. Huh? Yeah, 17. And really, like, start 17 and 18, a deputation from John, the disciples of oh, John reported. Oh, hold on, hold on just a second. Let's, uh, 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 Luke 7, which one? 7, and then uh, 17, 18, 19, 20. The report concerning uh, Jesus went out all over Judea and in the surrounding district. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. And summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the one or do we expect someone else? Yeah, there's, there's still some other verse, baby, that we're looking for. Uh, yeah, um, yeah I, there is one other, though, that's more clear, and I will get it for us. I promise. Okay. Good, is, good job, though, Chelsea, because I was I – was, Gleaning through seven, and I I didn't find anything at all. So it, at least you found that. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, is there another question on anything we covered tonight? So just basically every book in the canon meets all the criteria that you said. It meets all. It, it meets at least one or more of the criteria. Uh, for example, they're not all eyewitness accounts of the life of Christ, for example. But in order to be a gospel, they had to be an eyewitness account or based on an eyewitness account. Like Luke was based on an eyewitness account. Matthew was an eyewitness account. John was an eyewitness account. Mark was based on an eyewitness account. So the extra books in the Catholic Bible? Yeah, what about them? Where did they come from? And well, those would be, point? yeah, those would be considered historical, but not inspired, not canonical. Um, a fair number of those were written between um, the last prophetic book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and the first book of the New Testament, any one of the Gospels. That period was four centuries, and it was known as the intertestamentary period. There was no prophet in Israel at the time. The last prophet of the Old Testament until John the Baptist was Malachi. But there were still spiritual things written. Uh, the Maccabees, for example, is a history of the Maccabean uh, revolt. John of the Maccabees. Uh, revolted against the Romans and led an insurrection against the Romans. And there's a history of that. And that's known as the Maccabees, for example. And Jesus never quoted from any of those, did he? No, he did not. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we know um, the old, that we can rely on the Old Testament is because Jesus quoted so extensively from the Old Testament, from the Old Testament books that we have today. Jesus quoted from them, his favorite being Deuteronomy. I heard a guy one time say, uh, we, we really only have a couple of choices. Either either it's God's book and he wrote it and he wrote it the way he wants it. And that's what we have today. Or uh, men put it together and they use certain criteria to put it together. Um, he said, if it's God's book and he wrote it, then it's exactly the way he, want it, he wants it and it is what it is. And he said, and if, if men got together and voted on it, 
then they voted on the books they wanted in and didn't vote on the books they did not want in. So there's still no missing books. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how you want to approach it. There are no missing books. And uh, I thought that was pretty cute and effective. Yeah, there are no missing books, but interestingly in the uh, Revelation, um, God tells uh, John to shut up and not write the things that he is seeing. So we, we do know that John had some experiences with God that, that did not get recorded in the canon. Uh, but there, there, there was no list of approved books that any group of people uh, determined. In fact, I will just add this one uh, bit of information, which I think is quite useful. Uh, what caused the church to make up a list to get together over time and kind of identify? Well, there was this dude named Marcion, and he was a heretic. And, uh, and so to combat him, to fight against him, the church started saying, well, well, what are the books that we recognize as inspired? And as everybody talked about that, it started to become evident that everybody was accepting the same ones and rejecting the same ones. So again, it was this organic thing where the where, where it emerged, but part of the trigger for the church to identify or recognize what those books were as a group, I mean, the church as a group, not the books as a group, uh, but the church collectively was this dude Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N, you can look him up. Um, okay, any other questions on the text? And then we'll open up for anything you want to talk about. And I do have a couple of emailed questions that we'll jump on first. Just, just yeah. okay, just conflicting. Like when, you know, I mean, I have Catholic family members. I was raised Catholic. I'm no long, I mean, I left the Catholic church when I was 18. But when you're referring to the church, the church accepting it as the inspired word of God, and then the Catholics say that the Catholic Church was founded on Peter. So which church are you referring to when you're talking about the church? Well, in the, in the first few centuries, uh, there, there, there was no Catholic Church versus Protestant Church. Protestantism didn't even come on the scene until the 1500s, the 16th century. So in the first century, there was one church. In the second century, there was one church. All the way up to the 16th century, there was just one church. Uh, but the church identified, some in the church identified error, and in identifying error, were forced to separate. And that's what is, was called the Protestant reformation the church being reformed being corrected but many stayed with catholic beliefs uh, at that time in the, in, the, in the 16th century and uh did not break away and they remained in those false beliefs and so you now have the catholic church out there which uh, of course still pers pers persists in their false beliefs of for example, that, you know, we should pray to, to dead people and, you know, that, you know, there are cardinal sins and purgatory and all the rest of it um, that are not biblical concepts. They, they still persist in those. And, and perhaps the biggest issue th that many people would have, me certainly would have with Catholicism, with Roman Catholicism, is the belief that truth is God's word and or church tradition what the church says what the church believes what the pope says or writes and that that's truth and the reformers john calvin and zwingli and um, martin luther and all all of them held to was faith alone, in Christ alone, and, and uh, scripture alone. So that was, we, we referred to that as solo scriptura, solo Christos. The reformers used those 
catchphrases to communicate quickly what they were all about. So when I'm referring to the church, I'm just referring to the, the church Catholic, the church universal in the early uh, centuries of its existence. Up to the 16th century. Yeah, well, well yeah, but well, well before that. Right. Ten centuries before that or more. Yeah. Because okay. those church, when the church came together back in those days, they were called councils. There were councils in... Uh, in the second century, in the third century, in the fourth century, uh, they really proliferated at the beginning of, and uh, following the fourth century when Catholicism, I mean, when uh, Christianity was legalized in the Roman Empire. You had um, many more councils then, but as the church came together, they, they continually recognized, it's like the guys from Indiana and the guys from Texas and uh, the guys from California, you know, they all got together and they all realized that that particular type of beef really was the most tasty. You know, that kind of idea. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. The body of regenerate believers. Believer. That is correct. Born, born again of the Holy Spirit. All right. I did have a couple of questions. So let's jump on those. Uh, let's see. And of course, they came in from our brilliant questioner, Ms. Tara. In all my life, I've never known this. You've never known what? No. All right. I'm, okay, fine. I mean, my head just got exploded. Like, how many iPhone users are on the call right now? No iPhone users on this call at all? One? Yeah. yeah. I did not realize that the widget for your clock on your iPhone was not just a picture of a clock, that it was literally tracking time by the second. I, I never, ever realized that. Okay, thank, thank you, I'm glad I asked. You, you asked, I was getting ready to mute it, that's your fault. I'm glad I asked, okay. All right, uh, Tara's question came in, uh, says this. I understand, now y'all listen carefully to this question. I understand that through God's foreknowledge, he knows who will be regenerated rather than him deciding to whom he shall send the Holy Spirit. I believe he gives us all the opportunity for salvation and he does not withhold that from us. However, only some will respond, those becoming the elect. In other words, are the elect handpicked by God or are they those he foreknew would be regenerated? Okay. This is a good question. This is a, 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 a question upon which you can build a solid theology. So let's think about this. The question is, is did God look down the corridors of time, aha, recognizing those people that were going to respond to the gospel, and then elect them and predestine them to that decision? That's the first question. That's called, that, uh, that, that would be called in many circles Arminianism, following the teachings of a dude named Arminius. Or was it the case that God, not looking down the corridors of time to see what would happen, but God choosing those people whom he was going to save um, and it had nothing to do with their own choice. It had to do with the choice God was making. And the reason God made the choice rested within him. So those are your two options. He looked down. He saw who was going to get saved, who was going to respond to the gospel, and who wasn't. Or he, out of his, for his own reasoning, chose this one and that one and the other one. A and B, which is correct. B. B is correct. Why? Because there's no person, if we read Romans chapter 3, we know that there's no person that seeks after God. There's nobody righteous. There's nobody good. There's nobody that wants to uh, acknowledge their sin. There's nobody that wants salvation. Um, unless God calls a person, that person is never going to respond to the gospel. So God uses the gospel, he presents the gospel, and he uses the gospel by the power of his spirit to convert a person, to give them a new heart. 
It's that new heart that can respond to the gospel and repent of sin and place faith in Christ. There's no person that can repent of their sin apart from being born again. That isn't, it isn't possible because the scripture tells us it, it's a chicken and egg situation. You, you cannot have a person who is making a decision to repent of their sin and place their faith in Christ before they're regenerated because they don't have a heart that will do that. That's why we can say that we have complete free will in election. It, it, you know, it, you know if, if God, here, I got, I got two cups here. If, yeah, let me turn my light off. There, two cups. Uh, this one's elect, this one's not. God didn't look down uh, the corridors of time and, and figure out which one was going to have the red straw. He put the red straw in the cup. The, 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 the one with the red straw in the cup is the one that he caused to be born again. This person doesn't have the Holy Spirit. That's what the red straw is. This person doesn't have the Holy Spirit. So only this person can respond. But when this person is rejecting God, follow me now. This is free will. When this person is rejecting God and doesn't have the Holy Spirit, this person is acting within his or her free will to reject God. I don't want God. I don't want this thing. I don't believe what he's saying. Or maybe I do believe it, but I ain't interested in it. I don't want none of that. I want to continue in my sin, and I want to do my thing. The person who has the red straw, the person who has the Holy Spirit says, hey, I hate my sin. I don't want to live like that. I want to live for God. I want him to forgive me of my sins. I'm going to run to him, throw my arms around his ankles, and hang on for dear life. That's my plan. My plan is to pursue God, to love him, to serve him. Uh, I want to be saved by him, and I want to be forgiven. Am I acting in my free will if I'm the person with the red straw? Yes, I am. So whether you're unregenerate and living a life that wants to reject God, or you're regenerate and living a life that is in pursuit of God, you are always acting within your free will. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it can never be the case that a person down the road God sees is going to be saved, and then he goes, okay, well, that's one of mine. No, he chooses who he is going to save and who he's not going to save. It says in uh, Romans 9 or 8 or 9, somebody look that up for us. Uh, Romans 8 or 9, re re referring to uh, Jacob and Esau, he said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I, uh, uh, Jacob, I love it. Esau, I hate it. God chooses his children. Somebody says, well, that's not fair. Well, actually, it's perfectly fair. It's perfectly just. God could send everyone to hell. If he chooses not to send some people to hell, the ones that went to hell still got what they deserved and what they wanted ultimately, which was not to be a, a part of his thing. They want to be separated from him. They want to have nothing to do with him. They don't, they don't want to believe, follow, obey, repent, have faith, nothing. That's not what they want. So he seals that deal, and that's what they get returned to. But the fact that he saves some doesn't make him unjust. Okay, I get that, and that's one of the things like Chelsea brought up a couple of weeks ago about free will. But to put it in basic everyday language, you're saying it goes like this. God decides who he's going to send expose the gospel to and through knowledge of the gospel that person will become regenerate correct and, he said that again, god, and, and, and if god wants somebody to be saved he's going to use the gospel to do it so he's going to get the gospel there okay but he's deciding like for example let's say you the red straw and i'm not the red straw so god is the one who de decides who that's he's correct going to Okay, so if God is the one who decides to whom he is only going to expose the gospel, mm -hmm. doesn't it say in the scriptures that everybody will be exposed to the gospel? Well, everybody is already exposed to the gospel through something we call natural revelation. Right. But just because we can look at, look at the creation and see that there's a God doesn't mean that we're going to pursue him or follow him. Every man knows in his heart that he's a sinner. Every woman in, in her heart knows she's a sinner. The scripture says to everyone is given a measure of faith, meaning 
we all understand there is a God. In fact, it says in Romans 1 that even though we, we know there is a God, we reject him and won't acknowledge him. That's right. the problem. So everybody knows there's a God. It, you know, I, I, I'm fond of the, of, the, of the saying, there is no true atheist. There's no person that truly disbelieves in the existence of God. They, they with, 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 with great enthusiasm, want to argue and defend and convince themselves, but ultimately their arguments fail because every human being knows there is a God. Every human being knows they're, they're, that, that he or she has been made and created by God. Now, they may not understand the image of God and you know, uh, you know, all these other aspects of theology, but they certainly know that they are simple. They certainly know that they are uh, that there is a God that exists, and 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 the logic is easy. This is why an atheist wants to deny even the existence of God, is because if there that. is a God, He created me, and if He created me, there's a purpose for my creation, and He must want something, and I'm not giving it. I get so that. we are condemned by our own knowledge of God, irrespective of the of the hearing of the gospel. Yeah, I get that. But are you saying that God decides that God I'm saying that over and over and over. Can I can I can I try can I say something? Yeah. And, and you edit me as I go. Uh, something that has helped me over the years kind of keep this organized properly is is to think about, you know, the plan of redemption and when it was agreed upon in eternity past. Um and it helps me to think of the elect as as uh, uh, the, the gift to the bridegroom. It is the wedding gift from God the Father to the Son. That is who the elect is. And for, for him to not give the full gift that he was intending to give. Like I, I was planning on sticking this many red straws in this many cups to give you as a wedding present. Uh, but I went to the store and they were out of red straws. I'm just not willing to sign up for a theology that compromises God's sovereignty in that way. If, if the elect is the gift from the father to the son, um, then everybody that he wanted to give up to him is who will be given to him. That's great. And, None will be lost. Yeah. No, um, no straws are going to fly out with the window rolled down, going down the highway. I get that. But like you're saying, like scripturally, you're saying that God, just like you could decide to put the red straw in the cup, God decides, I'm going to regenerate this person. That is correct. Now, it doesn't mean that the person doesn't have to do some things. But the fact is, if you give a person a new heart, they will do those things. They will repent right. of sin. Right. They will place their faith. And they will do so with a free will. Right. Yeah, I get that. Um, okay. We are told in 1 Timothy that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Yes, and he desires that nobody sin either, but we do. Right. Right. So, so, so his yeah. desire is there. I feel like maybe part of what Tara may be grappling with, which, you know, I think maybe we all have um, at one time, is that the, and I, I get your analogy and stuff with the straw in the cup. It could, I mean, I know that it's not, but it could come across as claiming um, that it's arbitrary. And of course, we, you know, we know that that goes against God's character. And, and, and I believe, I'm sure we all believe that he is not arbitrary. Um, but I think maybe that's the rub there is that, you know, the well, actually, straw in a cup comes across as arbitrary. But Shalina, I would say that every single thing that God does is arbitrary. Everything that God does is arbitrary because everything that God does, he does by his own fiat. He, he decides what he's going to do. He's not, uh, he, his grand plan is not influenced by anything or anyone. Now, we, we do have the ability to influence him through prayer, but that's because he told us we could. But when well, it comes I do believe that he's purposeful, though. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But when it comes to when it comes to who is going to be saved, it is utterly arbitrary. In fact, the 
in my view, maybe the best way to understand that, although we don't like the word arbitrary in some circumstances, uh, God, God was arbitrary when he decided what the, the laws of physics were going to be. He was arbitrary when he decided how many uh, stars and planets there would be. He was arbitrary uh, in uh, asking his son to, uh, in, the, in the book of Hebrews, we'll cover this, uh, to enter into the eternal covenant before the foundation of the world was even laid to be the, salva- uh, the, the savior of mankind. I mean, and there are all kinds of things that he did arbitrarily, including, as Dustin said, offering a, a, a wedding gift to his bride. I mean, to the groom, uh, uh, the wedding gift of a bride, and um, and and choosing who that bride would be. There, there's nothing about us that is appealing to God while we are in our unregenerate, sinful state that motivates Him to choose us. Right. Because then it wouldn't be grace. It would be something that we've earned, something that we've merited, something that you know we you know we got we hang a plaque on the wall. Hey, I did this. This is my achievement. And the fact is that there is there is nothing about us that is pleasing to him or that warrants that decision. In fact, for him, it's not even a decision. God isn't, for example, presented with options and he chooses one. It's not that kind of election. It's, it's, it's the kind of election where before God even created the universe and before he even created mankind, he knew to whom he was going to offer regeneration. It's not a mystery to him. All of those names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, and the Scripture says, that the names were in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world was laid. Our names right. were written there. I like what you said about to him, because when I was thinking about that arbitrary thing, it's, it's, really, it's really only okay to use that word from our vantage point. We see through the glass dimly, but if, if we were God, if we were on his side of the fence, it may not be arbitrary at all. We just, we have no idea that it's too vast. We can't comprehend. So from our limited you know, knowledge and understanding and perspective, it, it appears completely arbitrary. And um, all we know is that whatever the reasoning is, if there is in fact a reason, he, he may, he, it may be the other way. He may have no reason at all. It may be, it may be his version of randomness. Yeah. We just that, don't have, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, you know, and, and I don't have any rhyme or reason to it. I'm just making these elections. And thus but even if we can choices. see that it's that it's arbitrary, and we just say, "Yeah, we just don't know enough," and it appears to be that way, that does not infringe upon his sovereignty at all. And and when when you said, you know, choice A, choice B, that that's really what it comes down to. Me, I mean, I, I've got lots of thoughts and lots of arguments for this topic, but at the end of the day, one of those choices causes me to compromise God's sovereignty, and one of them doesn't. Let me read. Let me read a verse to you from uh, from the Revelation. Uh, it's referring to the uh, uh, to the image uh, that that uh, will be raised up by the Antichrist. In verse thirteen eight, it says, "And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written." Before the foundation of the world, in the life, in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So those of us who are the elect, those of us who are being saved by regeneration through the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, our names were written down before he uttered, let there be light. So if we, if we use the word arbitrary or we use the word sovereignty or we use the word predestination or if we use the word election, they all come down to the, to the point that has nothing to do with us, it has everything to do with him. And I, I don't expect that this conversation will fully settle these matters for all of us, but because as as Shalana said, there's a rub there. And from my perspective, 
the rub is is that we can't cause another person to be saved. No. We can't pray that person in the kingdom. We can't convince that person in the kingdom. We can't evangelize that person in the kingdom. Why not, Lord? Why can't we be in church? Because I'm God. That's why. I will decide. You don't decide. Okay. Next question. Uh, let's see. We had... Ah, good question here. This is her other question, and we're going to wrap on this one. We just have a couple minutes, and we really do want to stick to the time. Uh, if we are safe through re regeneration and responding to the Holy Spirit, yes, that's correct. Uh, hence, accepting Christ as our Lord, and we are not saved by works, then how was it determined in the Old Testament who would be saved? Well, no better book to study that question than the book of Hebrews. <laughs> because the book of Hebrews shows us that there was a that there was a uh, a model of salvation that was lived out through the sacrificial system that pointed to Christ. So when God said, "I want you guys to follow this this sacrificial system and the Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement and the temple sacrifices and all this," when He said that, He said words, and when they when they believed what He said and did what He said, they were trusting in His word. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when we believe what God tells us, we are placing our faith in Christ. Think about it. His word, Jesus is the Word. Christ is the Word. When God speaks and we believe it, we're trusting in Christ. So when we believed in the Old Testament, we believed that old sacrificial system we were placing our faith in Christ because we were placing our faith in, the sac faith in the sacrifice that God was using as a symbol until the sacrifice actually occurred. So those Old Testament saints looked forward to the cross just like all of us look back to it. It's not future in our lives. It's behind us. But even though it already happened and none of our sins had occurred yet, we could still look back at what Christ did on the cross, place our faith in that, the same way the Old Testament saints looked forward to the cross and, and, and trusted in God by acting it out until it was fully realized in Christ. And that concludes our time. Okay. We can follow up maybe more on that later. Sure we can. You bet. Okay. Um, All right. awesome. Could uh, some, some, uh, one of the ladies pray for us and then we'll be dismissed and I'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody needs me with my supper's uh, ready. My wife's called me three times. So what do you ladies pray for us? I will. Oh, God, uh, we just praise you that, um, that we can talk about you freely together. And we ask that you will put your hand over this uh, Bible study, that you will draw those to it that need to uh, hear from you, Lord. And uh, we just uh, seek your wisdom and grace through this. In Jesus' name, amen.